Hi, I'm Dave Fernell, the editor of Diagnostic and Interventional Cardiology Magazine. I'm here at the University of Colorado, and I have with me Frederick Masudi. He is a professor of medicine, division of cardiology at the University of Colorado Hospital, and he is also the chief medical officer for the NCDR. And I wanted to talk to you about the NCDR, its impact on cardiology, uh, why it was created, and uh, what's come about over the last few years. Well, the NCDR is a very interesting story, I think, and it uh, began about 20 years ago now with the establishment of the cath PCI registry which is a registry that as its name would suggest assesses uh, the care and outcomes of patients undergoing diagnostic angiography and percutaneous coronary interventions um, and it's an interesting story in part because 20 years ago was a time when there was really no talking about uh, paying for value uh, it was talking uh, we were living in a fee-for-service environment um, and there wasn't a lot of focus on quality of care. Uh, and the American College of Cardiology, and what I think was its wisdom, established the CATH PCI registry as a means for cardiovascular professionals and cardiologists and the teams that they work with to uh, demonstrate the quality of care that they were delivering to patients undergoing this very common procedure for mm -hmm. coronary artery disease. And over that 20 year period of time, the NCDR is involved to now 10 different programs covering a variety of different cardiovascular procedures such as not only cath PCI but implantable cardioverter defibrillator, the ICD registry, uh, left atrial appendage uh, occlusion device with the watchman, uh, the TVT registry in conjunction with STS, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, uh, which addresses issues of percutaneous valves. Um, also uh, high impact conditions like a, uh, acute coronary syndromes with the chest pain MI registry, which is formerly known as the Action Registry. So there are 10 registry programs in both the hospital and ambulatory space that provide benchmarking and feedback to sites about the quality of care they deliver for patients with cardiovascular disease. And that really was the principal objective at the beginning of CAT PCI and the beginning of the birth of NCDR was the ability for sites to collect detailed clinical data on the patients that they serve mm -hmm. and to generate out of that evidence-based performance metrics to feed those metrics back to sites with benchmarks on a national level of how all sites are doing with respect uh, to these processes of care and with respect to the outcomes that they achieve to allow sites to identify gaps in the care that they deliver and to act on that and to improve the care they give to their patients. I think there's a perception when I sit in a lot of the sessions at TCT where uh, a lot of sites and a lot of cardiologists, especially some of the well-known ones, they'll, they'll say, you know, we think that we're pretty good and we think that all of our friends are pretty good and everybody else is second rate. Yeah. But also when you have a, a measuring stick to take a look and you start measuring, they've admitted, they said, you know, once you start measuring, you start comparing yourself and you actually have real empirical evidence, you start realizing that everybody has their flaws right. and that uh, you need to learn. Yeah, that has been the case, I think, throughout medicine. It all starts... Uh, at least with American medicine back at the mm -hmm. time with Ernest Codman, who was a surgeon at Massachusetts General Hospital in the beginning of the 1900s. And he uh, started looking at the care and the outcomes he delivered to his patients and decided to start his own hospital, which he actually called the End Results Hospital. Mm -hmm. And he started reporting uh, in the open the complications they had on their surgical procedures. Mm -hmm. And other surgeons thought this was crazy. And when he tried to push to get others to adopt this, uh, he was really ostracized from the medical profession to some extent. Mm -hmm. Down the road, you know, quality then became this idea of, yeah, this is someone else's problem. We're gonna look for the bad apples and we're gonna try and identify those few people who are committing these, you know, grievous errors and we'll right. try and get them out of the profession. Um, and then there was this growing recognition that quality is a systemic issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Institute of Medicine in about 2000 published a book called uh, Crossing the Quality Chasm. Mm -hmm. And that's a very dramatic word, but one that's well merited in the sense that what we were discovering in cardiovascular disease and throughout medicine was that problems with quality were systemic issues. Mm -hmm. They were all of our problems. There are problems in the care that I deliver, there are problems in the care that my hospital delivers or my site delivers, and there are problems all around the system and there are ways that we can work together and by understanding the quality of care we deliver finding those areas where we could do better and improving on them is critical and quality is not only an issue of uh, a rising tide raising all boats mm -hmm. uh, rather than trying to find a few bad apples but it's also really a team enterprise and understanding that it re that it involves uh, individuals throughout the system, individuals on the care team to work together to improve quality. It's not on the shoulders of any one individual. It's all of our problem 
and it's one that we need to solve together. Do you really see the NCDR as maybe a, a vehicle of uh, what the future may hold for a lot of the allergies out there and maybe able to benchmark? Because if you have a trial, I mean, you're benchmarking the centers that are in that trial, but with the NCDR, it's really trying to stretch out to say, what, what is everything industry-wide, uh, nationwide, for all of these procedures and devices that we're using? Yeah, so it's a great model to assess quality of care mm -hmm. and to provide benchmarking back to sites. There are also other roles that the NCDR plays that are important as well. They help sa It helps satisfy uh, criteria for CMS coverage with evidence decisions in some cases. Um, it helps, pr it, it, we've worked in collaboration with the Food and Drug Administration or FDA mm -hmm. uh, to conduct post-market surveillance studies. So a really broad range of ways that the NCDR data help us improve the quality of care we deliver both at a um, uh, at the level of, uh, say, a hospital, but also globally. Mm -hmm. um, that having been said, yes, I think it's an excellent model um, for uh, understanding the quality of care and the outcomes that we achieve uh, in clinical practice around devices. Now, of course, there needs to be a model to sustain a registry like this. Now, uh, in the current system, you know, we can't just get information out of medical records because despite the fact that there's this high penetrance of electronic health records, mm -hmm. the way things are documented in clinical care is not consistent and not standardized. Mm -hmm. And the EHR platforms are really not built to support in general, the standardized collection of a wide array of, of clinical data elements. So for instance, you might be able to get gender or age out of a, a medical record. Sure, that's easy. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to issues about you know, what's the New York Heart Association classification of a patient or the, what's the angina burden the patient's experiencing or um, what are the details around some coronary anatomy. Those things are where the EHRs, even the electronic platforms that are now pervasive, really fall short. Mm -hmm. And so there still requires a, a fairly significant amount of person power to collect those data mm -hmm. because we can't use, say, claims data from CMS to calculate performance here. We need detailed, valid, standardized, credible clinical data to calculate these things. So it's a great model, but it's one where there needs to be uh, the possibility for it to be sustainable because it does require a fair amount of person power at this point uh, to collect the data to support these important uh, aspects of what the NCDR does. And here at the University of Colorado, I know you use Cedaron as a, um, a software to actually help integrate a lot of the metrics that you have from cath lab reporting and that I into the NCDR and uh, other registries that are out there. But uh, there's still an awful lot of manual labor that you still need an FTE nurse to, to work on. Right, so there are vendors that we work with, like Cedaron and others, that help facilitate the collection of data. And those are very important and those are helpful. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, there is some degree to which uh, individuals need to be working uh, with the medical records to get that information. We do have programs like the Pinnacle program, which is an ambulatory program that extracts data directly from the EHR mm -hmm. uh, and assesses the quality of care in, amb in the ambulatory setting. Uh, we, uh, it's a bit of a trade-off there in terms of much greater scale. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't, you don't have individual clinicians for every single clinic visit entering data into a registry, that wouldn't be feasible, but you're able to collect data on a much greater number of clinical encounters. On the other hand, the data quality uh, suffers somewhat because it needs to be, again, pulled directly out of the electronic health record, which, is gen which, which works in some cases, but particularly around procedures when you're talking about detailed criteria for candidacy for a particular procedure um, and those uh, factors that may go into risk adjustment uh, when you're calculating risk-adjusted outcome metrics, you really do need those detailed standardized clinical data. And uh, the FDA, I know, has been involved with uh, the, the TVT registry, for right. instance, where it's basically an ongoing post-market study for all of the valves that are put onto the market because they said, we want a metric to be able to see what these things are doing. Right. But in addition to that, they're also being able to use this registry data now almost as an ongoing clinical trial to actually help get additional indications. Right. So it, it, uh, some of it, I wouldn't necessarily call it a trial in the sense that it's not, you know, randomized and we can you know, debate about, you know, the the... Uh, what you would call, but certainly the data that can com that comes out of the the registry can demonstrate that you know, for instance, for valve and valve taver, mm -hmm. that uh, the procedure can be done safely, um, and that the outcomes are generally good. And with with the existing data from clinical trials, um, and complemented by uh, what we know from the registries, I think that has encouraged the FDA to, uh, to uh, say, expand an indication in, in that particular case. I think also the, you know, the FDA has uh, worked hard to uh, 
achieve this balance between innovation and uh, in terms of getting products to market, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, making sure that they're safe and effective. Um, and uh, they know that if they want to accelerate the diffusion of technology into clinical care with maybe less um, requirement for front end evidence, mm -hmm. that post market evidence is becoming increasingly important. And it gives you a real world perspective. Right. So, it, and it gives you a perspective of patients who are treated outside of the reaches of clinical trials that tend to be a relatively rarefied mm -hmm. uh, population relative to the, you know, the folks that we see in clinical practice. Well, thank you very much for your time. Absolutely.